Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod and patronize me. Now, usually this podcast is a little too um, uh, week to week to really have any sort of thematic run outside of I interviewed four people at a comic show, so everything is comics related. Um, but there's actually kind of a neat through line to these last three episodes. Two weeks back, we had the cartoonist Glynis Fox on, and she talked about her work with Greek and Middle Eastern archaeology and, well, what ancient Greek culture was like, how she was uh, sort of brought into that world. And um, last week, we had Chris Nelson, who was president of St. John's College, which is a, a school focused on the great books of Western civilization, beginning with the Greeks and the Romans. And this week, we get Anne Patty, author of the new book, Living with a Dead Language, My Romance with Latin. So you get an idea about the through line here. Now, maybe Living with a Dead Language is too written just for Gil, but I really enjoyed it, and I, I think you will too. It's a memoir of a, um, well, a, a lago maniacal former book publisher who leaves New York City for a wooded enclave uh, about an hour and a half north, and decides to start learning Latin in her 60s. Well, at, actually, at 58, but most of the book takes place in her 60s. You know what I mean. Um, so Anne uses the, well, the course of the book covers four years of her process of studying Latin at Vassar and Bard as an auditor uh, to kind of reassess her life and um, the exit she made from New York under duress during the financial crash, um, and most importantly, her, her relationship with her mother, um, who died around the age and is closing in on now, and who struggled in her own life to sort of find her own identity outside of being a wife and mother. And we see how Anne's life, um, while she strove for a great deal more independence, um, also led to sort of a fundamental disconnect from her own mother. And this process of learning Latin kind of helps her reconcile with that. It's it's a pretty neat book. And beyond the process of, of learning Latin as a language, uh, Anne also gets into key pieces of Roman literature, and those also help spur the, the whole self-examination um, that kind of fills up the book. Um, so we get to see how like the, the works trigger anecdotes of Anne's rise in the publishing world. Um, she was the person who discovered Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews, and um, that, that leads to some interesting stuff that she can and can't talk about over the course of the show. Um, but we also learn about other parts of her life, like her, her two marriages, um, the cancer she went through about 20 years ago, her newfound love. Um, actually, the the newfound love gives her this amazing gift that Anne sets up perfectly throughout the course of the book, so the payoff is is absolutely dynamite. Um, I should point out, Living with a Dead Language is a really unsentimental book. Uh, Anne's very unsparing, uh, depicting herself, particularly as a an older in classes full of 18 to 21-year-old students. Basically, there's a 40-year gap between her and the, uh, the kids. And that dynamic comes up in some interesting ways. Um, Living with a Dead Language is a blast. I got to tell you, um, I didn't know what to expect going into it. Uh, my friend, past podcast, Peter Trachtenberg, recommended that I, I talk to Anne, uh, mentioned that the book was coming out. I figured right up my alley, but you never know. Um, 
Anyway, you should give it a read. It's from Viking Press, and you do not need to know Latin to enjoy it. I mean, I don't, and I did. Um, Although I did study Attic Greek in the summer of 1992, which does come up in the course of our conversation. Anyway, here is Anne's bio from her site, annepatty.com. Anne Patty worked in New York trade publishing for more than 30 years. She was the founder and publisher of the Poseidon Press and an executive editor at Crown Publishers and Harcourt. Her first discovery as an editor was V.C. Andrews' Flowers in the Attic. Other highlights of her career include the U.S. hardcover debuts of George R. R. Martin, Graham Swift, Mary Gateskill, Patrick McGrath, Clive Barker, Frank Zappa, Michael Moore, Siri Hustvet, and Kristen Hanna. She was the editor of Stephen Milhauser's Pulitzer Prize-winning Martin Dressler and Jan Martel's Booker Prize-winning Life of Pi. In 2008, she became a freelance editor and began studying Latin, which she continues to do. She teaches Latin to teenagers at her local library in Red Hook, New York. Living with a Dead Language is her first memoir. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Anne Patty, which begins with a tortured analogy that seemed less tortured when I thought of it during the drive up to Rhinebeck. So your book. Um, there's a thing called a Zeppo. A Zeppo? Yeah. Um, it, it came up in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer where a supporting character turns out to be the lead for one episode. A guy you don't really think too uh-huh. much about. All uh-huh. of a sudden, he's the lead. Uh-huh. And... He keeps trying to enlist the, the main characters, and they've got other giant things going on. They don't even notice he's there, but he's actually saving the world this one time, and he can't get anybody else to help. Ooh. So I was thinking about your book, and it's your, your first foray into memoir. And you have other stories. You have, you have cancer. You have the relationship with your, your parents, especially your mother. You have this history in publishing. And yet all of those get minor side treatment and your study of latin the zeppo in this case i think comes to the fore and you know is is the focus and and center of the book we could talk about why you took up latin but why the book particularly why why this topic for for your first foray into to memoir um i don't like memoirs where people sit around and whine about what they're doing i like a memoir where i learn something and i go Mm -hmm. into a different world and i when I started writing the book, part of the reason I started writing it is because I'd be out with people and they'd go, oh, God, she's going to talk about Latin again. <laughs> and I needed an interlocutor to talk about Latin with. Mm-hmm. And my writing, that was what my writing was. So it was always a book about Latin. And the other people started coming in. My mom started coming in. George came in. The gardens came in. So the book was always... To me, Latin wasn't the Zeppo. Latin was the topic. Yeah. And that's what I'm wondering. To a conventional writer, they would say, oh, my history with cancer, my history with this. Oh, and my you, history with cancer. What that's could be thing. more boring? And that's the thing. For most people, that would be the... people have done it. Right. And that would be the, the, the center of a, a, heartwarming, a heartwarming story, as opposed to a heartwarming one. Um, and you, you chose a, a different path. You went with Latin. Talk about the, the decision to start studying it first okay. and, and where that all began and then the, what you discovered in the process. The decision to start studying Latin came, I had moved to the country. I had rebuilt my house. I had sold my apartment. I had moved to the country. I had a part-time job where I went into the city two days a week. So I still had that nice tether with the editorial world, with my which, which was my world. Mm-hmm. Uh, pub, being an editor was my calling. So I had that world, and then I got fired. And here I was living in the middle of 11 acres, wondering what to do with myself. And I did freelance work, but um, I worked with really good writers. They don't hire freelancers. Mm -hmm. A few of them do on the commercial side, but not very many. So what you get is a lot of wannabe novelists. I couldn't bear it. So I had to figure out what to do with myself because I have a little bit too much energy. I don't sit still well. Uh, my husband, as you know from the book and today, is out hiking all the time, and I need to have my brain active verbally. And there, you just can't read all the time. So I figured out, it took me a year or two to figure out that I needed to take Latin, 
that that was the one thing in life I had missed. And I love grammar. And so I started taking it. And I didn't know what would happen. I just knew that's what I was supposed to do. So that's what I did. Did you see it as an open-ended process? Or did you tell yourself, well, do a semester and... and... No, I did. It, the, the beginning class is a year-long class. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, I figured it was going to take me some time to learn it. I didn't know for sure how it was going to feel to be back in school again hmm. and to be 40 years older than everyone else yeah. in class. Um, so I didn't, I didn't think about it. I just started following my nose. It's actually the same way I became an editor. I just followed what I knew and what I wanted and what I was interested in. Hmm. You're talking to someone who, at the age of 43, suddenly found himself becoming a lobbyist. So, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. you know, that sort of... Uh, so, I did, I, in a path. way, you could say I started Latin out of desperation mm -hmm. to keep myself and my brain alive. And desperation has what Latin root? Despero. Sparrow, no, uh, un, no, sparrow means hope. Mm -hmm. d with the D-E in front of it means to hope, hope away, yeah. away hope. So, despero means, yeah, hope is gone. Bye. <laughs> so how much of that do you find yourself doing? Oh, my God. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. Can I Great. give you my favorite one of this oh, week? Oh, feel free. This yeah. is, I, I love doing it. It makes me so happy because I'm, I'm, I'm in year six now, and I'm starting to get a little better. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. I need another two to four years mm -hmm. to be where I'd like to be. Um, so... I'm in the city, and you know we're talking about the presumptive nominees. And I was like, presumptive? Does it mean presumptuous? And then I thought, wait, it's from pre, before, sumo, sum, or sumpti, sumpto, which means take up. So it literally means before taking up. Mm -hmm. So it's a pure Latin word. Right. So, so yes, I love doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's fun. <laughs> That's why I had to write a book, because I can tell my book those things, and it will listen to me. Whereas other people might say, okay, we've heard enough, Anne. Yeah, Anne for God's <laughs> sake, with the words again. You know. And you have mentioned being a, a, a colonel in the word police, that so you're, you're pretty high-ranking as far as... I as, believe I am. Yeah. I have a great story about that. Can I tell you? Feel free. Um, last week, uh, Mary Norris and I did an event together in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There were only two, three people there, but no matter whatsoever, because Mary Norris is my favorite new person. Now, I read her book, and she was my favorite person. And our interests are very, very similar. Mary does not correct her friend's grammar. I do. Um, so I am more obnoxious about it than she is. Now, my guess is, and we didn't get that far, but we will have to discuss this, that she doesn't correct people's grammar because she copy editing is such a focused dive into usage that it's her job. I just took it off as my hobby. Yeah. And in fact, I've helped people. Mm -hmm. Do they know they're being helped, or do they actually resent you immensely? This is a big sticking person. point between my parents growing it up. It depends so. on the person. Yeah. My husband actually appreciates it. I try not to. I have learned not to do it in front of other people. Yeah, that's the sticking that point. That they don't like. Yeah. But my first husband did me the favor of correcting my grammar. Mm -hmm. And my mother did until she gave that up. I actually was going to put this in the book, but I couldn't figure out how to think about it um, because she would correct our grammar when we were young and by the end of her life she sometimes spoke with bad usage just gave up you think I think she gave up yeah but even that that, that was so embedded in her it was yeah curious mm -hmm. yeah. part of the book is about the reconciliation you have with the memory of your mother through the study of Latin, which she pushed you toward when you were young and which you refused, and you have the medal that she won. I was wondering what that looked like because I envisioned it as a much larger thing that was a big medallion or something. Oh, no, so, it's quite beautiful, uh, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's lovely. Uh, and you said it's got a, a quote from... No, it just says Virgil. Oh, it has Virgil the, on it? Across okay. the sail, cool. yeah. Um, what have you learned, not how have you reconciled with your mother, but how is your relationship perhaps with your daughter change over the course of understanding how you rebelled mm. against your mother and have come around uh, to maybe understand things you could have done that would have 
help the relationship? My relationship with my daughter is so different than mine was with my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I had joint custody of her from three and a half. Um, she is also a member of the grammar police, and once she even corrected me and did a little dance. <laughs> uh, she's also a very literary person. She's getting a PhD at the University of Chicago in English literature. So yeah. we're, no, we're... Apple's not falling far from the tree. But I would say she rebels against me by not talking to me nearly often enough. Um, you know, there's that, there's that mom penitent that you have with a daughter who's in her early 30s, and you're kind of irrelevant, but they're mm. not to you. Um, and so I think about how much I would like to be closer to my daughter, and I think about how much my mother would have liked to be closer to me. Hmm. That's what I wonder in the process. And you portray it very well, the terms of reconciling yourself to the things she would have wanted. Right. Um, right. And do you, do you find yourself in that respect trying to, to correct something in your own life now looking forward? Does your daughter listen to you at this point, uh, based on what, what uh, went on in the it, book? When she's in trouble or she needs money, <laughs> she always <laughs> well, listens to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically she does. I mean, when I give her advice about fashion, hairstyles, weight, eating, stuff like that, no. Yeah. She has a true injury, and I need to say, no, you don't go to the doctor. You go to an acupuncturist and a chiropractor. She will basically listen to you. Hmm. So, so has, I'm, I'm just thinking has my relationship i just came to understand my mother better mm -hmm. and i was old enough to understand how hard you know it's hard mothers and daughters unless you're like those really lucky people who get to be best friends their whole lives yeah, but they're hiding something well everyone's hiding something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i wasn't going to say it because I'm, I'm hiding something <laughs> um you mentioned readings, uh, and you, the book has just come out in the last few weeks. You've done a few... Just a uh, week and a half. A week yeah. and a half, okay. Yeah. Um, but you've done a few I have. readings so far. Who comes? You, you mentioned only having a few people, the, the Mary Norris one, but well, what sort of people are showing up? Well, my reading up here was very well attended. In fact, I was told there were 67 people there. Gee. And I think that was because I sent out emails to everyone I've ever met up here. <laughs> Who no, knows me that? at all? Shameless self-promotion <laughs> is an important thing. And... Um, Anyone who knows me at all knows I've been doing this for a long time, and, and I think they were just being very kind to me. Or were they afraid that if they didn't show up, you were going to notice and hold it against them? I mean, it is no, got that small town no, vibe, but, but, but okay. <laughs> no, but you know, you yeah. show up for your friends or you don't, you know, yeah. you know and they did, and it was wonderful. Okay. And what I realized at that reading, and it, and it was how my reading ended, and I realized it as I said it, with this book and writing this book, I wrote my way out of New York City and into becoming a happy full-time Hudson Valley resident. Yeah. So that was fun. And then I had one in Woodstock, and people came to that, too. Mm -hmm. And Abigail Thomas was there. Have you ever interviewed no, no, her? No, no, I don't know her. Oh, my goodness. You know who she is. No, I, I, I think I've seen the name, but I don't know her at all. Oh, you will be. I, I'm, I'm Heaven. terrible. Yeah. What'd she do? She's a memoirist. She's the daughter of Lewis Thomas. Ah, okay. She's quite well-known. She's a bestseller. She writes, that must be why I don't know her. I'm just kidding. Go, she go. writes nothing more than a page and a half at a time, and she's a truly wise woman nice. and fun. Yeah. She's my mentor. Indeed. Yeah, who were your Well, your I published influence? her, and it was she who tricked me into writing. Okay. Yeah, what was that process like? like what, what was the moment you realized you had a, a book? Oh, that was two, three years in. I, I realized I had a book. I was... I was attending her writer's workshop and just writing little pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. Actually, one about my mother has made its way into the book, the, the tree piece. Yeah. I lifted that from an earlier piece I had written. There's I nothing that, wrong with that as far I as I know. I think that was the only thing. Um, so I wrote pieces about the trees around here mostly. And and it was a similar way of going in, as, as Abigail would call it, going in the side door. Because mm -hmm. it would be a plant, but it would be a better person. So... Um, after I started taking Latin, I didn't begin writing about Latin until I was in year three. I had to know it before I could write about it. And I sat down and wrote the first chapter. And I thought, wow. I mean, ten times, but yeah. 
but at least you had a... I thought, this is cool. So I took it to the workshop, and they liked it. And then I wrote the second chapter, and everyone got completely lost in it, which people do with my book. But mm -hmm. Chapter two, you got to learn some Latin. Um, and then I just kept writing. And then I went back and rewrote. And then I... So I knew, I would say by chapter three, that I had a book. Mm -hmm. I had always suspected there was a little part of me when I first started taking Latin. And I've checked with this with Curtis when I asked him if I could take my class. And I said, and there's some chance I might write about this. Yeah. But and it was okay. At it least was in sort terms of in my mind, yeah. but well, I didn't know. You'd had a life in publishing. I mean, you, you, I imagine, think of things outside the ordinary as potential books. Maybe that's why I'm not in publishing. Um, I have a misconception of this, but at least you would think this is a, you know, a stage of my life that could make for an interesting narrative. Well, I thought Latin could make for an interesting narrative. Yeah. <laughs> Without Anne, just, just Latin yeah. itself? Okay. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I'm an enthusiast. It's why, yeah. it's why I think I was a good editor, because mm -hmm. I fall in love with things and I get very enthusiastic and then I boost them. Yep. So now I'm a Latin enthusiast, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just my character. It, was it difficult for you writing about yourself then? Some parts were painful. Mm -hmm. Some parts were, you know, I left out a lot. Yeah. That feels like the, the other books that are yeah. alluded to, the, you know, the main no, characters. No, I didn't for, want to go into the cancer world. slog. I mean, ugh, yeah. who needs that? And um, writing about George was kind of delightful. Because I, I think I came to understand him better writing about him. Mm -hmm. and, Has he uh, read the book, by the way? He, he did. It took he did. him a while. <laughs> I had to give him permission to skim chapter two. Yeah, I was going to say he blew over the Latin <laughs> part. So, yeah, I can't understand any of this. And, and, and he's a star yeah. in the book, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, and uh, so that was fun. I don't know. It was a real exploration for, for me because in a way I'm a novice writer and in, in a way I'm not a novice writer at all I've been yeah. writing all my life I mean I've rewritten books I've edited you know I've yeah. so yeah how did this process differ for you oh, it's Being much on, more frightening I'm sure much yeah. more frightening in fact George always tells me you know I was there when you didn't know if this was worthwhile or if you were going to have a book or I was there when you were filled with doubt mm -hmm. I was filled with doubt and now you seem much more self-assured. I'm just kidding. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm filled with doubt if I have another one in me. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. But it differs in that you're, you're alone with it. Mm -hmm. And at all, there's nothing on the page. Yeah. It's much easier once something's on the page. Once something's on the page, even for me as a writer, it gets easier. Mm -hmm. It's the blank page, which is terrifying. Were you able to sympathize with that based on the number of writers you'd worked with over the years in your, your editing and publishing career? Uh, made me love them even more. Yeah, now that you understood what it was like from the uh, the blank pages perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it made me even, even uh, especially novelists. I wouldn't have the guts to write a novel. Mm -hmm. It made me admire them even more. It's much harder than being an editor. Yeah. I mean, not in the fact that when you're an editor, you have to deal with the corpo... Yeah, buddies. the business side of it, The too. business side, which is, I kind of like the business side, but I didn't necessarily like the people I had to yeah. deal with. But understanding the business at least gives you a better idea of yeah. what, what's necessary for yeah. a book to succeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's, you know, uh, there are difficult parts of being an editor, and, and, and as the publishing world has changed, they've gotten more and more difficult because the editors have been disempowered. And there is groupthink. And there's nothing more horrible in the world than groupthink. Any book I was ever successful with would not have been bought if it was subjected to groupthink when I bought it. Hmm. I include Life of Pi in that. Yeah, well, I believe it. Um, read another interview of yours where you'd mentioned even uh, something like Fifty Shades of Grey, which we could say is group think not would literature. Never buy it. Yeah, it had to start out as a self published book and then become. And there was a stretch where, seriously, I got onto an airplane, and I think it was four Everybody. out of four out of five people who had a Kindle or a book out. I could tell were reading that. Um, I never was, read it. Me neither. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, but it was astonishing to me that it, it reached I'll go that back level. To the story so, of, oh. <laughs> yeah, but 
You know, I, I wonder because uh, we're seeing a generation now of kids who are now college age and beyond for whom Harry Potter was right. the intro to, mm-hmm. to reading and, and literature. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm interested in finding out how that affects their approach to, to literature. But I'm also more worried about the people for whom Fifty Shades of Grey was their, their moment of, I'm going back to books and, you know, what that means if they actually, uh, you know, Look, keep looking. My belief is there is a certain intelligent portion of the reading public who are literary and care about things literary, wordy, etc. I think that portion is not huge. I wouldn't hazard a guess as to how big it is, but I think it's pretty much a steady portion. And the bestseller list does not reflect those people's reading tastes. Hmm. Perhaps nonfiction more so would reflect it a little more so than fiction perhaps trade paperback more so. But at any given time, in my 35 years in publishing, there was usually one really good book on the bestseller list, and the rest were throwaways. Yeah. And you know what? I published a lot of throwaways, and I enjoyed them, and I enjoyed reading them, and telling a good story and making me happy for a couple days. Yay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, Nothing wrong with it. Again, the book sold. People were actually reading. That's a lot better than, you know, reading numbers going down and everybody locked into a screen. Yeah. What did change in publishing? I mean, what was the... Corporatization. I assumed, but I wanted you to say it, not me. Um, so really that consolidation... The evil of the American system. Corporatization. Untrammeled capitalism. Not good. Remember, one of the biggest owners is from Germany. I know that. Yeah, so it's not just American, but yeah, it's it's. No, but we have an election of... coming up, and I had to get my two cents in. You probably cut them out, but no, you know. no, I I let people do yeah. their thing, yeah. which is why whenever uh, <laughs> and I always tell people, usually it's a guest who asks, um, "How are you going to monetize this?" Which is one of the worst words to have been coined in the last it's twenty years. It's a horrible word, and everything has been monetized, yeah. and I hate it. Not this. Nobody uh, who's going to want to pay. To reach the people who want to listen to an hour-long well, conversation about books. Well, really? unfortunately, <laughs> if you were that kind of person, I bet you could get on the internet and find someone. I bet I bet you yeah. could do a, a what is the crowdsourcing? Oh, um, I do a Patreon thing, but it's it's there's a few fans. They put right. up a little money every right. month, but it's it's that as opposed to advertising, right. which, right. as we know, tends to drive the content into what makes for good advertising markets, and that's not what I'm doing this for, and that's what I do my day job for. Um, but you saw publishing from essentially the 70s till mm-hmm. after the financial crash, which would have been the time. That at the financial at, crash. Really, the financial crash was the, the, the cutting off along point. with yeah. it. It crashed onto my head. Right. <laughs> but that was the period where consolidation really began in the 70s, where things really started yes, turning did. into it did media companies. My very first job was at Dell, which was Dell and Delacorte. And then that got caught by, bought by Doubleday. And then I was no longer there, but Doubleday then got bought by Bantam, which then got bought by Bertelsmann. I think I've got this right. Anyway, it was it was one of those those fish stories of the minnow and the bigger and the bigger and yeah. the bigger and the bigger. And that's happened to most of the major publishers now. There are a few small independent houses, but not many, and they can't compete in terms of advances, you know, and, and it's become, a, well, good books get published. They will always get published. There is, I have a great editor myself, Paul Slovak, who is, you know, not that young, but he's got another 10 years in him, we hope, or more. He still publishes poetry. He's publishing good books. They let him because hmm. every now and again, one of them makes money. Yeah. And it's always the balance of the money making and the art. Uh, and different houses have different feelings about that. I always tried to take what, what my philosophy was when I was a baby publisher with an imprint is I thought, first I have to take care of their agenda, which is to make the money, and then I get to do my agenda, which is yeah. to publish really good books. Yeah, my, my wife and I were on IMDb, the, the movie database, a few mm-hmm. days ago, um, trying to figure out when a certain Will Smith movie came out for completion's sake. And... Um, we had both forgotten about the existence of the Wild Wild West adaptation Will Smith was in, which also featured Ken Branagh and Kevin Klein, ah. both of whom said, 
we did this so that we would have the money to go to do, do Shakespeare and go yeah. to Ivanov yeah. and, and, you know, do what we want right. to do for six months. Right. But right. yeah, balancing that uh, render unto Caesar aspect. Well, I guess, most, is, uh, most editors actually specialize either in the commercial or the literary. I was one of the few people that did real low. I had lowbrow, highbrow, not a lot of millbrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, most editors do specialize, but mm -hmm. not all of them. Yeah. Do you think you could have the career you had? Nope. Yeah. They wouldn't let me. Mm -hmm. They would. I I parlayed the VC Andrews thing into a career when I was really young because I made them so much money. Yeah. No one would have let me buy that book. It was ninety pages. It was practically illiterate. No one would have let me buy it. Mm -hmm. But I, you know. To me, it was one of the most entertaining parts of of living with a dead language was a sidebar into the history of flowers in the attic and right. B.C. Andrews and discovering Well, as you that. know, I, I can only talk about it to a certain point and then I have to stop. Yeah, I, I put down a little non-disclosure line here in my, my questions. I'm like, probably not, not worth pursuing too far, but, you know, if you ever write about it more completely. I well, can't. Everything's... Uh, I'll get sued. Yeah. As the lawyer said to me, I said, I have documents. She said, you may have documents. You may win. You will lose. Yeah. They have more money than you. Do. That's that's how you the system lose. works. So find something else to do. So anyway, <laughs> but but of what you can say, you were the person who first uh, brought flowers right. in the attic right. to to the right. publisher right. And, and managed to start that amazing franchise. Um, yeah, and they let me buy it, and I was like a twenty nine year old who had hardly published anything in my life. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen now. Yeah. Do you have regrets about the way your publishing career? No, I had a went? wonderful career. Great. I mean. The ending, yeah, but the but, ending you know. I regret. I mean, the 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 way that SNS thing ended was not fun either, and I feel I was treated badly. But things in that both were, places, things that were under your control, though. Things that were under my control. I had a wonderful career. I am most grateful for it. I loved it. Uh, things had been different. I'd still be doing it, but no, I'm just grateful. Mm -hmm. At so, least I had it, and I and I was there when it was fun. Yeah. When I talk to people who are still in publishing, they say, Anne, it's not fun anymore. Don't miss it. We're not having fun. We had fun. Most people I know um, younger than me in publishing are always, are you hearing, uh, is there anything open at company X, Y, or Z? Like there's there's a constant state of, of you know, this is not anywhere to stay, um, yeah, which is part of why I went into trade magazines. Um, right. I like to pretend that I, I had foresight about this. It was really just that publishing paid nothing, and I yeah, needed I some job that actually paid a little bit better, so uh, trade magazines turned into uh, right. lobbying. When I started I in publishing, it, I had to supplement my salary with uh, typing, Yeah, because I was a really fast typist, so <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> Hey, so it, I paid the rent. You can pretend it's, it's part of the, the publishing ecosystem or, you know the typing ecosystem and some uh, well who, part who, of yeah. part of the ecosystem however is and that it's not always the case but a very large percent of people in publishing were helped by their parents when they were young yeah. and came from families like that i was at a, at a conference in australia once and the the very interesting owner of a small publishing house says no one can become an editor and be in publishing who didn't have that in their family. And I said, well, I'm sorry, sorry <laughs> but here I am. My parents didn't go to college, mm -hmm. you know, so how are you going to fit me into that line? But but it is true that most of the people in publishing went to good schools, good colleges, and are we'll upper say, middle class. We'll say trust funded in some respect. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Not everybody, but I would mm -hmm. say 80%. Maybe 75, 80 percent. Yeah. So what's your experience on the other side now? What, what, did, what did the experience as a publisher and editor give you as far as uh, knowing what you were in for? Extra terror. Yeah. Extra terror. Really? More daunting than if you were coming into this with Noah? Uh... Yeah, because I know too much uh, okay. about the world, <laughs> but I knew too little about what was going on with my book. Because when you're the editor, you know everything. You're getting a vibe in house. Is this working in house? Are people liking it? Or are they not liking it? But as an author, you didn't. You weren't able to ask some of the questions. Well, you knew I kind of could. I kind of could, but I didn't want to because I didn't want to be an obnoxious writer. Okay. Because I was afraid that because it was me, people would think, "Oh my God, I've got that bitch dealing to yeah. deal with." Oh, <laughs> no way. Yeah. Um, so I didn't want to be obnoxious, and. Um, 
I guess it's just the anxiety of waiting for it to come out. Mm -hmm. I loved my editor, as you can, I, I, I think everyone likes my jacket. It's wonderful. Yeah. It started out being bright yellow, and I had a major tantrum about that. <laughs> um, my The editing process was subtle and wonderful. The copy editing was good. My publicist is a young woman who is unbelievably good. She placed this article in the Wall Street Journal for me. Yeah. All the other writers I know complain about their publicists. I scored. I was at a reading a couple of weeks ago in Brooklyn for a first-time author I, I met last year uh, through Pete Trachtenberg, actually, oh, our, our mutual yeah. pal. Um, you call him Pete? <laughs> I've never heard him called Pete <laughs> in okay. his life. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> I always go short. You know, I'm a one-syllable guy, so Gil, that, that's it. But, yeah. um, and I just saw a picture of him yesterday, Sven Burkert, oh. this morning, Sven Burkert's posted a picture of him from Bennington at the MFA program. Oh, because he's up there, right. Cranking away right. on the, the guitar, but... Um, yeah, he, uh, uh, let's see, he connected me to a, another writer who I met in, at this place in Brooklyn. And before the reading, there were a couple of very, very young women um, talking about their novels, etc. And I just, yeah, I had a, I was envisioning girls on HBO, and it was right. just very dismissive of me. Uh, then realized one of them was actually this author's publicist uh. at what looks to be, you know, 16 years old, but apparently, you know, still pretty good. And, and she admitted she didn't know the author at all. The book was dropped in her lap. Turns out to be absolute dynamite. Mm. Uh, really mm. wonderful first mm. book. But uh, yeah, I was just like, really? This is okay. You're, you're a book publicist. I don't know what the... Uh... Well, the young ones aren't jaded and they have something to prove. Yeah. I, I was, when I was a young editor, I w had something to prove. I wasn't jaded and I'd work my bagunzos off i'd rewrite your book for you <laughs> you yeah. can make something happen i had to so i think i think going with youth is always a good plan mm -hmm. yeah what were you worried about just going into the process like in terms of being edited in that terms i'd of... make a fool of that i'd made a fool of myself yeah. that i'd embarrassed myself in some ways mm -hmm. that my book was an embarrassment um i realized early on that that was not the case because i had friends who read it who you who, trust. Who I trusted mm -hmm. and who I knew would be honest with me. Um, and then when it got bought, I got really happy because I was at a good house and I was with one of the best editors in New York. <laughs> and and really, it's just been a, quite a pleasant experience. And, and now the reviews I've gotten are much better than I expected. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're making me really happy. I'm just happy. And does the Latin world see you as a, a great ambassador at this point? They or is do. it still too They're early? They're starting Good. to because <laughs> they do. And because the Wall Street Journal article, really, they're posting like crazy and thanking me. And as I said, I'm an enthusiast. Mm -hmm. So I want to become girl Latin reporter. Yeah. And, and I want anyone who wants to have something written about the Latin world to come to me. And I want to go to Rome again. And uh, I have... Two other pieces I've written and one I want to write um, about the world because I think it's really interesting. What about oh, about the Latin world? Yeah. Okay. In fact, it's one of the tensions you bring up <clears throat> in the book uh, related to the, the piece you just had in the Wall Street Journal about the, um, the living Latinists, the people yes. who want to actually speak Latin, yes. et cetera, versus, um, actually, I don't know what we call the, the, the other side. The traditionalists. Of, okay, I was going to go with scholarly or, yeah. you know, fusty, but, but yeah. traditionalist is good, too. Mrs. Grundy. <laughs> Can you go a little bit into the, well, the dynamic? what I think is happening, and I do not live in academia, okay, so I'm not going to be the best, but you're girl most Latin trustworthy reporter, so it's okay. source. I am girl Latin reporter. <laughs> I think the living Latinists are taking over. I think it has been proven, as you see in this article, that if we are to keep Latin alive, uh, the way it's been taught has to change, or else it's going to just get tinier and tinier and tinier. So teaching Latin more in the way a modern language is taught, I think, is inevitable. Everybody who's at these, not everybody, but most of the people who are at these conventions and, and conventiculum and biduum mm -hmm. are in their 20s and 30s. There are a couple other oldsters, but things change, and I think it's changing now. And as these people become the people coming up in the world, especially the thing that I find the most interesting about this world is it, it seems to me to be composed mostly of high school teachers. There aren't that many college professors 
that go to these things. And these things are events where everyone is speaking Latin Only to Latin. one another. Yeah. Only Latin. Yeah. I should point that out beforehand. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> that's the, the nature of the living Latinist movement is a, a conversational yes. Latin. Well, there's papers being presented, et cetera, but it's... Right. it's... But they may be presented in Latin. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're speaking Latin. It's, it's quite difficult, mm -hmm. but it's really fun. And the people in it are fun. They're not like just geeky old nerdies. They're fun people. Geeks and nerds can be just fine. Trust me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I enjoy going to those and I'm going to write. I'm going to one for a week at the end of July. Mm -hmm. And I'm terrified of that. That, that is scary. That, I think it might be more scary than writing the book. <laughs> just in terms of not being able to not being able to speak or not being able to, to understand what they're saying? I'm, be I'm better at understanding than speaking because mm -hmm. my default is French because I did take 12 years of French. So I have to get past that to get to the Latin. I think I'm going to be getting a lot better. But it seems, it, it's, I, I wrote a, an article for another thing where I compare it to a Zen session because it takes the same kind of seriousness and devotion. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of exhausting. And they even have little ways for you to warn that you're over full up and you have to escape. They, so? they actually let you do that. <laughs> uh, are there warning signs? Uh, do, do they you, have something yeah, you need to watch out for? Yeah, you use some gestures saying. Oh, okay. But nothing that you can recognize internally when you're starting to lose your mind. That's uh, that's what I wonder. Do they have warning signs that oh, no. you realize you're starting to... to... No, does someone say, I'm not... Your yeah. tooth is flying out. <laughs> yeah, your eyes are going backwards. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, no. So, but, but that's how, because what I, what I want to do now is I really want to teach Latin. And in fact, I'm giving a Latin class at the local Red Hook Library. I have one young 10 year old genius I work with and I have a, a class of junior high girls, but I have no pedagogical training. So I go to these things to learn teaching methods so I can become a better teacher. Hmm. And I'm hoping at some point I will get connected to a school for like five or six hours a week. I'm not willing to work more than that, but I really, you know, want to be a Latin teacher. I and I don't care if I make money. It's all I'll do it all pro bono. I don't have to be paid. What have you learned about teaching? I just love it. I love being around the kids. It's th mm -hmm. and when when you have a good class and the kids are getting it and they're engaged, I'm high as a kite. Mm -hmm. It's thrilling. What was your relationship like with the fellow students, which you characterize somewhat in the, the course of the book, your fellow college students, uh, well, you were auditing, they were, you know, right. attending, attending. Um, a, can you talk about that a bit, just how you dealt being a, a, about 40 or senior to most of them? Uh, and B, how your experience with them may be informing what you're doing now in terms of teaching, since they're not that much older than some of the students. Oh, they're, they're college students are very different than a junior high school student. We like to think that, but there's some respects that I don't think life's much In different than junior high. In terms of learning, oh, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, with the other students, you know, most of them just avoided me entirely, but a few didn't. And then as the classes got smaller and I kept hanging around, <laughs> and here she is again, yeah. I got to be more friendly with them. Did I ever have lunch with any of them or have a social life with any of them? No. And I didn't want to impose myself on them in that way. As I say in the book, there were a few that I wanted to ask if they needed another mom, because mm -hmm. I would be happy to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I enjoyed watching them. Yeah. Uh, How different are they from when you were in school? You know, I went to Berkeley in the late <laughs> 60s and early 70s. I forgot. I went to Hampshire in the late 80s, so I I've got some of that. don't. Uh, remember okay <laughs> what what things were like yeah my my granddaughter who is my my steps my first husband's son's daughter who is yeah. my chosen granddaughter because we're still in touch is here this weekend and she's just been looking at schools and she fell in love with hampshire yeah is it a good school no not for what i needed um but i'm but it's not a good school i don't know we're a little off no, but I'm just... I don't know. I mean, you've got Bard near here, and people always consider Bard to be Hampshire light in, mm -hmm. in some respects, except you've got much more of a cultural center around Bard. Um, Hampshire of 1989 to 1993 
was not useful for the sort of education that I needed. Okay. Uh, I mentioned in last week's episode where I interviewed the president of St. John's College, where oh, I went for my graduate institute. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a good one. Uh, but I went there immediately after Hampshire for two years as a graduate student. Uh, and it is the anti-Hampshire. Uh, Hampshire, you design your own curriculum. It's a great book school. Yeah, yeah. it is the great book if school. If I had it to do over, I would Everybody go there. says that. And that's, that's, <laughs> my thing was, and I mentioned it in the interview, I just think 18 would have been too young for me yeah. to be there. But I realize that a lot of other 18-year-olds go there, and it's it's made, I think, to deal with the immaturity, even if you're a smart 18-year-old. Um, it, it's built in such a way that by the time you come back around in 19, uh, when in your 21, 22, you start to look back at right. what you did when you were 18 there, right. and it, it makes more sense. Well, I um, could see a difference. There was a cup. There were a couple students um, who I was with for four years. Yeah. Especially Alyssa, who's in the book. Yeah. That's not her real name. Um, I changed everyone's name in the book except Siddhartha because I couldn't bear to change. Yeah, it. that's a great one. <laughs> Asked wow. his permission. I said, <laughs> "I've got to use your name." Said, okay. <laughs> anyway, I watched her for four years, so I saw her go from a very young girl into a young woman, mm -hmm. and it was lovely. Have you stayed in touch with anyone? Actually, uh, all my t my teachers, I mean, Curtis yeah, and I are yeah. buddies. Um, actually, I'm having a party in the city next week. And um, Alyssa and Siddhartha are coming. Oh, good, good. I can't tell you how excited <laughs> I am. This is my very small, fancy party Yeah. at the Sherry Netherland. Um, but they're coming to that, and they're the mm. people I'm most excited to see. <laughs> Do you know if they've seen the book yet or not? I imagine they have. Okay. I mean, I imagine they've at least gone and looked at it. I plan to give them each a copy because you know, I, I don't... Kids, you, know. you never know. They might just say, oh, yeah, I heard I'm in this. But, you know, you know I, you'll, Who knows? you'll find out next I'll week. I'll find out next week. <laughs> I will. <laughs> now, you mentioned uh, Berkeley in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, you mentioned when you first get to Vassar... Uh, here that uh, the classics are no longer the classics. So now, uh, Greek, G R S T. Yeah, Greek and Roman. What was studies? It? Greek and Roman yeah. studies. Even that S T is kind of weird. Yeah, that's what I was, I was trying to, to yeah. deacronize. Um, Ooh, that was almost like monetize. Uh, yeah, yeah, mm. I know. It yeah, hit me on the fly. It's, I'm never going to use it again. I promise. But, um, that that sense of the uh, we'll say the politically correct, even though that term has been uh, taken for very very right. uh, purposes. It, yeah, it's been <laughs> yeah whipsawed. Still, that, that that sense of um, uh, the culture changing Oof. though, in, in that way, how much how involved were you in that that part? How much did you uh, observe of that as part of being a student in the the late? Well, in the early 20 teens, I guess. I know you don't have a basis of comparison because you were no, an asshole. No, I don't. All the time, I would but, say yeah. that there was there was certainly you know d diversity, gender diversity, mm -hmm. which didn't even exist as a concept. I think when I was in college, um, there were warnings. For example, our teacher, our in our Catullus class, there was a line in the syllabus that said. <sighs> some of this work is sexually explicit. If this will be a problem for you, let me know. Yeah. I don't think that would have happened. No. Um, I, I do have a trigger warning anecdote that I'll tell you off mic uh, about my time at Hampshire. It's, okay. it's long and involved. It has a very funny punchline, but okay. if I tell it here... There are a lot of... Uh, they don't have this at Vassar, and I've Curtis and I have discussed this a bit, uh, but you know, at Columbia, they had to have a trigger warning about Ovid. Yeah. And it was written about extensively in The Atlantic and elsewhere. I was not too aware of that. And the other thing you have to realize is that my beginning class was 28 kids. After that, the size of the class was 5, 6, 7, 7, and 111. These are tiny classes. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows what they're in for? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, you know who's who's going to become a classics major? Someone who really loves it, hmm. someone who really likes tra the grammar translation <laughs> method, <laughs> which I like too. <laughs> yeah, do you find yourself looking at, if you're reading uh, a translation of Latin? Do you find yourself sort of trying to reverse engineer what's there if you don't have the Latin in front of you? If no, you see some verse, I don't do you know. See your... what, I don't know. Okay, I was just enough. wondering if if you see yourself thinking, yeah, I wonder what that was that turned into this in English, or no, that because a... I really don't read much in translation. Okay, the Latin I read is I read Latin, mm -hmm. and then I try to translate it, and there will be a translation that's next to it which I won't agree with. Yeah, 
for example, I, and I write about this in Catullus uh, with this old book where this, the translator took huge liberties. And of course, there is a ongoing discussion, which will always be ongoing, is what is better, a translation that is true to the actual words or a translation that is true to the spirit of the work. So there's that's a slippery slope because a translation is a translation. Yeah. So, well, when I went back to St. John's two weeks ago, we were doing a four-day seminar on Anna Karenina. We uh, were using the Pavir and Volokonsky uh -huh. translation, and just a week before the seminar, Janet Malcolm's piece came out about how Pavir and Volokonsky are actually awful right. Right. translators of Russian. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not bringing it, because it's St. John's. You don't bring that into the room. You, right. you bring the book itself, and that's it. Right. Um, but yeah, there, there's a degree of, yeah, this is sort of accepted as the gold standard now, but people are already saying it's it's not it's not what's there in well, Russia. Well, that's why one wants to read literature in the original, because there is, especially in Latin, there is a richness in what Latin can do, because it is a highly inflected language that we can't do in English. Mm -hmm. So you can't show Ovid rock and roll in the language in English. I mean, I write about that, yeah. and, and, and I've gotten, which is lovely, uh, a, a friend of mine wrote a piece about the Ovid in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and we got some really good comments about what to call some of his devices, and a couple other people posted poems in English that also did that. Nice. So. That might be the first positive use of comments on the internet ever. That's that's fantastic. That's well, I think Chronicle of Higher Education. It's called Lingua Franca, yeah. and it's a blog post about language. I think the people who are reading that are pretty serious. Oh yeah, but still, someone's going to get compared to Hitler the longer the the comment thread goes on. Well, but, there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's with the internet. It didn't so. go on that long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who do you wish you had read when you were younger? In in not in Latin, but which of the the Roman authors? Uh, Virgil. Yeah. I only got him when I was like 40 or so, and it was such, I realized I was such a moron for not reading him when I was in my 20s. Well, as I, I say this, and then I talk about that, you know, that one survey course we took, which, and I, after that course, which is three months long, and we went through, I don't know, a thousand pages a week, who knows, it was huge. Isn't it great what they expect college kids to do versus what we have to do as adults? It's, you read it, I was like, well, how did I read War and Peace over the course of four weeks? I don't understand. <laughs> If you have nothing else to do, you can't. Yeah. Um, but when I read him as a 20-year-old, I thought, oh, he's kind of a neurotic hero. I didn't get it at all. Mm -hmm. And when I reread it, and I did reread the Fagel's translation when I was doing, I, I read the whole thing, I thought, this is, this is rock and roll in this novel. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, novel, epic. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just thought it was, it was a page-turner. It was like one of those good bestsellers. Yeah. But did you also feel him more fully as a, a It took me four readings of the Iliad before I finally got Achilles as something other than a petulant douche. Oh, I think I got Aeneas because, you know, we I was doing an intensive class on... I mean, I really need another couple of classes on the Aeneid. Mm -hmm. We only did uh, book six, right. which is the underworld. And we did it along with Lucretius. So I didn't get a huge amount, but I did... I really felt I understood Aeneas because this is really going to sound grandiose, okay? But mm. I'm going to say it. It's just us. No one's listening. Um, I had to find a new homeland just as he did. Mm. I had a homeland. It was the publishing world. I was exiled. I had to find a new homeland. So I completely identified with him. Mm. And it felt just about as hard <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. It wasn't as hard. And you weren't carrying somebody on your back, literally, <laughs> no, <was> but <laughs> emotionally maybe. But yeah. Oh, I had like... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so I, I actually completely identified with him. Mm -hmm. You also have a segment where you compare Catullus's Rome to the New York City literary world. Uh, did, did you find yourself drawing parallels like that as you were doing these studies overall? Uh, mostly that Catullus in the 1970s, my first years in publishing, I really did find that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Aeneid, you know, Aeneas and, Aeneas and me. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, Roman history, you can draw so many parallels. I mean, you saw me draw the parallel of the uh, Laudatio Turiae, which was a... The, uh, 
inscription, the long inscription a man made for his wife, and that brought up my mom again. So, so the the studying, I think it happens when you read any good. How how I used to tell as an editor, if I was in the presence of a really good book, one of two things happened. I either got out my journal and started writing down lines, or I had to put the book down because it was sending me into a memory about my life I had never had before. Mm. And it was taking me back to my own life. So, and I still would say that's true. That is how I judge a good book. If they weren't offering Latin anywhere nearby, what would you have taken up? I probably would have commuted to Hunter and really? gone. Okay. Yeah. So you wouldn't have had Greek as a fallback or something? That's a... Well, if you don't take, if you don't offer Latin, you don't offer Greek. True, true. That's not going to happen. And so. I had at first thought about taking Greek because. In the old days, I preferred the Greeks to the Latin, but it just seemed that much harder. I did so ancient I Greek. So I chickened out. <laughs> uh, I did uh, Attic Greek in 1992, which is how I ended up at St. John's College. Oh. Um, my brother, well, to give you an idea of the, the nerd and geek thing you mentioned, uh, my brother, who had just finished the Graduate Institute down there, said, hey, we're going to do a class in ancient Greek for six weeks this summer. Why don't you come down to Annapolis and study oh, with, with me? Oh, with one of the... In, in, yeah. yeah, so one of the tutors at St. Right. John's. Actually, um, she was part-time. Her husband was a tutor. Um, she taught, and I, I, yeah, sure, six weeks of Attic Greek. Sounds fantastic, Bo. And and went down to Annapolis and had my life changed. Um, cool. It did actually help because I can transliterate. I can't translate it all. My brother kept up with it and now teaches ancient Greek at a, a private school out in St. Louis, among other things he teaches. Um I, on the other hand, was able to, to make great inroads with the princess of Yugoslavia, um, which I, I mentioned a, a few episodes ago. Back in, in my mid-20s, I had a moment where I, I transliterated a bunch of um, Cyrillic on the uh, uh -huh. um, the crown jewels of her, uh -huh. her family. And, you know, it, it was a very strange PR junket I was on, and, and she and I bonded in a, a pretty nice messed one. up way. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, the, the different alphabet and the completely different sense of, uh -huh. of uh, uh -huh. um, a language – to me, at St. John's, um, that college in particular was very Athens-centric in terms of its, yes. its classicism. Yeah. And to that end, that's why I didn't discover Virgil till my early right. 40s. When I right. went back, one of the tutors, right. who was a Roman Catholic, said, you know, really, we're too at a Greek here. The way he put it was, um, you needed the Greeks to come up with the concepts, but you needed the Romans to create the institutions. Right. And um, that's where right. I started with... with right. Well, and Madonna. all of all of uh, Roman literature, all the literature I've studied, all the poets, they're based on Greek so, meters. Yeah. And what's so interesting is is how they figured out how to shoehorn it into Latin, for which it's not natural, yeah. you know. Uh, and Horace was the grandmaster of those. He did he did something in I believe almost every extant Greek meter. Mm -hmm. And that was my knock on them, was that they were a knockoff right. of the Greeks. Right. And I didn't get the right. original. The, the way I ended up summing it up was that uh, uh, Homer is Michael Jordan and Virgil is Kobe, you know, Kobe Bryant. So it's it's not quite the level of Michael Jordan, yeah. but oh, still I, really, really I, good. I, I so, to... Yeah, write that one down. That's uh... <laughs> What's it called? What's that episode? Oh, um, I forget which one I, I brought that one up in, but it, it's from oh. one of the, the ancient Greek, one of the Attic Okay, well, I'll, I'll, have like to, I'll have to listen to those. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, you'll spend all you your know, time I just listening never, to old podcasts. The That's only it. podcast I've ever listened to in my life was when we were driving back from Florida this winter, I listened to The Serial on NPR. Yeah. And I now have learned that there's so much interesting stuff going on in podcasts. And now I have a car that can tune into my cell phone so I'm going to be starting to listen to podcasts soon, nice. and, rather and than books on tape. <laughs> which I've never been able to do. That For some reason, I've never picked up on, on books on tape. I don't know what it is. I, I need to be reading, reading. Well, don't you why. don't want to read a really good book on books on tape, but someone like P.D. James, you know, really good You're mystery right. writer. That makes sense, yeah. Or a good short stories. Mm -hmm. Short stories are good on tape. I have to give them a shot. Okay. Give it a shot. Because I, I generally... Try it's either... Alice Monroe. Give her a shot. Who I would love to record with someday, which I'll also hit you up about potential uh, people you know. Who oh, I'm are, I, yeah, I, I already got a few for you. <laughs> oh, nice. Good. Along with Pete, not Peter. <laughs> Pete! <laughs> I don't know. I just, you know. Um, so I want to ask about science fiction. Oh, I had a much bigger section on it that yeah. was cut. 
And my assumption was that you've got a, a science fiction background in, in some respects. You, you allude to the culture in a way that isn't just a stereotype of a bunch of, of nerds and geeks. And you also mentioned David Hartwell, one of the, right. the great late uh, editors the late, in the, right. the field. I just met him last uh, November, mm. uh, a few months before he mm. passed. I uh, had a wonderful conversation yeah, lovely at a festival. Man. Yeah, um, sad. Mm. Yeah. What is your uh, your science fiction well, history? Well, I w- really wasn't a reader of science fiction, but what happened is David Hartwell and I were at Pocket Books, and then I got Poseidon, and David your own, your own imprint, my own imprint, and David had published George R. R. Martin as a paperback original, and when George Martin wrote Fever Dream, which was his first hardcover novel. David somehow funneled it to me. I don't remember if it was through the agent, but anyway, so I published George R. R. Martin's first two hardcover, and I have them also in my yeah. library, hardcovers. And because of that, I went to a science fiction convention. Mm-hmm. and Which can be daunting. To meet him, really. Yeah. And that was the piece, I, that didn't kind of belong in the book, so it got cut out. But I really didn't know that much about science fiction but i knew david pretty well and he would explain it to me Mm -hmm. um but i never really published science fiction i published horror and i don't really read science fiction Mm -hmm. but i couldn't help but notice (laughs) that all the lot of the latinists do so i started pondering those similarities and they became quite obvious that you like to make up your own world Mm -hmm. but again not in a uh a stereotype way. Yeah. You, you manage people to portray who like them as to people. make up their own worlds. Yeah, would you say that characterizes you, or do you like to fix other people's worlds? <laughs> yeah, I like to fix other people's <laughs> worlds. That's why I'm so popular. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let me just correct your grammar, and also this paragraph needs a transition. And <laughs> I do do that. It's bad. Um, do I like to make up my own world? There are people that sometimes say to me, "Oh, you're off in Anland," so. Yeah. I guess I do. I don't know. I don't know. I have to ponder that. Mm-hmm. I obviously did in this book. That's kind of my world. Yeah. I mean, my whole life is pretty much in there. I alluded to. I, I think you you do have other threads and strands, not planet chemo, but but other ones that could be followed. Yeah. Um, do you see that? Which I mean, ones do you see? Well, I don't want to tell you. I'll, I'll give everything away. But uh, no, the um, the publishing history outside of the things right. you can't write about, right. um, I think there's a good deal there. Yeah. Even balancing um, balancing family and that, right? Um, there's probably either an interesting memoir, or you know, you say you don't want to write fiction, but that might be how you get to address some of the things you. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, maybe a Western. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with some way of, of transforming that experience into into pages. Yeah. Are you writing besides uh, articles and such right now? Right now I'm only writing articles, articles, mm-hmm. articles. And uh, I was asked at one of my readings with in Woodstock with Abigail, who I talked about earlier mm-hmm. in attendance, someone said, well, what's your next book? And I just kind of crossed my eyes and looked at him and Abby said, you're not allowed to ask that until at least six months after publication. And that's what I've assumed was the case. I just wasn't <laughs> sure, you know, you being used to publishing pipelines might have some sort of, well, I've already been working on, you know. but that's, uh, yeah. So we have veered pretty far away from Latin itself and, and, and the book. I, I apologize for, you know, right. following all the currents of your life, yeah. but that's yeah. what I do. This way people can listen to it a few years from now and think it's it's still, you know. Oh, I'm sure there'll be. Absolutely likely to do. <laughs> Evergreen. You'll see. Every, May we both do that well. <laughs> every so often, there's a day where there's like 200 downloads, which is clearly wow, somebody really? grabbing every single episode, and then cool. there's the, the other ones that kind cool. of fluctuate over the year. But uh-huh. there'll be ones that you know somebody has just discovered the show, and there's suddenly a spike of people uh, of of you know. That'll be me when things calm down. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll see. Things never calm down, really. But um, when we talk about building your own world, um, is this place we're in these 11 acres? Um, also and land well i bought this house as a weekend house 32 years ago so this whole half of what you see did not exist here Mm -hmm. the house looked nothing like it looks now yeah um so yeah i i i was single when i rebuilt this house so it is really this house was built to my specs Mm -hmm. and i 
How well does it accommodate you being a, a couple? Well, I love, I'm a, you know, it works pretty well for us. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the stuff is my stuff. George doesn't seem to mind, and he has secret hordes of stuff everywhere. I'll show you. <laughs> Uh, we won't take any pictures, you know. He we have well, know. we have what we call Anne Land and George Land. So, mm-hmm. I'll take you out to George Land. This is Anne Land, and out there is George Land. But we, but we live very comfortably together. Mm-hmm. You've got a pretty extensive library. I do, and well, it's all over the house. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a particular a, a physical prized book? I mean, I'm sure your book is the one you care about the most obviously um, but is there something you've you've mm-hmm. are, are you a, a physical book fetishist and is there something uh, really... not as much as you would imagine me to be I was just I, I don't know because I can't um, tell if somebody gets physical, so many no not that much because I think when you're in publishing at least for me books they so many of them came and went that that's I, what I was wondering are there I, so many that it's, yeah. it's no longer my a, most prized book is the book that's mentioned in the book which is my um my friend Humphrey's artist notebook that I oh yeah, have. and I'm hoping that I'm going to take some pictures and post a few on my Facebook website. In fact, I'm hoping to get that published. Yeah, did it you? It would burn... be very expensive. Yeah, but there's a world now. Yeah, for there's niche a world. I, I I haven't. You know, it's something yeah. I haven't. But I think about that. Do you feel that you burn any bridges on your way out? No. Okay. I just I don't, don't know. know. And, you know, some people... There's only one person in the book I think I wasn't very kind to, and that was the ablative absolute. Yeah. Everybody else I think I'm pretty kind to, don't you? I don't, I don't think I was mean to anybody. Yeah. No, I mean in your life in general, on the way out of publishing. Oh, did I burn bridges? Probably. Were there, ha- were there houses that you would not have been able to submit this book to? I would not allow it to be submitted to Houghton Mifflin or Simon & Schuster. <laughs> okay. I don't care how good any editor there might or might yeah. not be. I would not allow it. Mm-hmm. But, I've gotten over uh, being starstruck generally. I'm sure there are guests I would still be a little yes, little I'm panicked sure. about. I'm sure. Actually, did you have any experiences of that with authors? The only ideas? celebrity I published, and I am very proud of it, was Frank Zappa. <laughs> He's got something. There's something and, about him now that's just coming out. Yeah, a movie. I spent okay. quite a lot of time with Frank Zappa. I don't think I was so much starstruck as just in awe, bedazzled, and kind of madly in love with him. I loved him. But he was somebody who sees the world radically differently than normal human beings. So uh, I imagine that's part uh, of the... Really? That, that's the vibe I always got. But of course, he died long before I would have been Read his adult. autobiography. He's No, he doesn't see the world that differently. He's okay. very brave. And he's out there. But he's smart and brave. And he was a total CNN news junkie. Mm-hmm. He, he was not just some weirdo. He yeah. was a lot more than that. He was a very intelligent man. I remember seeing him testify in front of he Congress and thinking, very... that's the Joe's Garage guy, man. No, that's, that's what that's what made him so fabulous is the two yeah. the two parts of him were just oh that was the most fun thing. Mm-hmm. That yeah, I was bedazzled. Yeah. Now my 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 only semi star struckedness over the course of four years mm-hmm. of doing this, um and it wasn't the guest himself, Jonathan Galassi. It was um Walking into the FSG uh, lobby uh, last year and thinking, yeah, that could have been a life I I, pre- I could have gone into publishing, could have tried to do the the whole literary thing instead of becoming a, a trade magazine guy, um, and seeing all of those those Pulitzer and and Nobel right. announcements right. kind of mounted on the walls, and that was my moment of, yeah, yeah, this is kind well, of well, Harcourt inspiring. was not unlike that. I yeah. mean, there were Nobels and Pulitzers, yeah. and one of my books won a Pulitzer. Who? Stephen Milhauser. Oh, that's right. That's, um, Have you ever interviewed him? No. Uh, uh, it's one Sar- of... Saratoga. You should. Oh, wow. I can put you with him. Yeah, because that's uh, David Gates had said that was, I think, his favorite novel, uh, uh, the one about the nine-year-old boy. Edwin Mulhouse. Edwin yeah. Mulhouse, yeah. That's everybody's favorite novel. <laughs> yeah, Any, yeah. Not even of Milhauser. He just said def- that was one of his yeah, favorite I novels. I published of about five of his books. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, He's a wonderful character. Yeah, I've got a few of the books on my shelf, and I've never, I've never tagged. It's just one of those, especially for the last we all have three those. plus years. Well, no, in my case, it's because of the show. I now read so much extensively right. just for the show itself um, that when I have free time, two years ago that was my opportunity right. to finally read the Divine Comedy because I had a month of. I haven't read it yet. It's either. okay, and I really want to. I've got a translation you should use. Um, the Durling and I'll, I'll zap it to you, Durling and Martinez. Okay. Um, because I asked at St. John's, I said, what, what should I use? And they said, oh, Durling and Martinez, because 
any it, it, it's a prose translation with the line breaks the idea oh, that they okay, said I like was that. yeah so it's not just running yeah, paragraphs which will, which will hurt the eye yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Uh, but they said when you're translating that Italian verse isn't a challenge because the words are going to rhyme as is it's almost too easy to translate Italian into to rhyming verse so don't worry about it it's not the Teresa Rima but they catch what's going on in between okay lines yeah because that's the that, that is the thing that has been I I did read Don Quixote this winter which I had never read yeah and I was helped because the local Oblong books uh had a book club and that little bit of outside pressure I only went to one of the four meetings of the book club, but I did read the entire book. Still, you, know, you were overprepared. <laughs> and it was really fun to come to, to have Don Quixote, uh, you know, hour every, yeah. for, I think it lasted, I think I read it in a month, and it was yeah. really nice to have, okay, we're doing, so. Yeah, what other challenges do you have like that? What what, what Moby Dicks, as it were, do you have uh, oh. that you wanted to, that you still want to tackle? Um, well, Later on, I'll ask who you're reading. I liked, but. I only made it through the first four volumes, the three and a half volumes of Proust. I would like mm. to go back and do Proust yeah. again. I would really like to do that. Um, and are there ones that are embarrassing, like that David Lodge um, story, <laughs> the, the the anecdote from one of Lodge's novels where uh, a bunch of college professors are playing a one downmanship game to say each one oh, has to say something okay. they haven't read, oh. and the lead I, character mentions a book that's so obvious that everybody else his career is shot because it's like King Lear or something like that. I've never read Saul Bellow. I've done two novels by him, but I did a I just interviewed a guy who did Bellow's biography mm. or a, a literary biography mm -hmm. of him, and it's great because if you read that, you don't have to read all the Bellow. Uh, Bellow's people. Re read, yeah. read that, and that'll sort of give you all the background. I've read, I've read short stories, but I've never read Bellow, mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to check him out. Um, I could probably reread War and Peace. I could probably reread Dostoevsky. I reread The Idiot a while ago. Um, but are there ones that you haven't tackled yet that you're still like, oh God, and I call see, myself a literary... Dostoevsky I missed? I think I have all... Oh, uh, you mean other, other yeah, books? Yeah, things you haven't I'm, read yet. Yeah, I'm sure there are thousands of things. I've never read Vanity Fair. I've never read A Pilgrim's Progress, which is very much on my list. Um, That's a whole era that I've, I've that's completely lost to me that I've never Yeah, touched. there are many uh, things I haven't read. I, 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 the, we would be here for another day yeah. if I were to okay, list. I just them wasn't all. sure if you had particular like, God damn, I can't believe I've still haven't done you know X, Y, or Z. But uh, the Divine Comedy, yeah, that's the big one. Yeah. So Durling and Martinez. I'll email okay. you about it later on. Three volumes, but okay. they're really good. When I interviewed uh, Prue Shaw, uh, who did a book on Dante um, mm -hmm. a year and a half ago. I was embarrassed to tell her that was a translation I used. She said, no, no, that's a very good one. I'm like, oh, thank God. Okay, you're a Dante scholar, and you think I, I picked the right one because. Yeah, there's that degree of of uh, um, anxiety, I guess. Well, and there, you know, there is a part of me that would like to do a class on that book mm -hmm. because I think I think going to a college course with a great book is really good. But I'm not done with my Latin yet. So. Yeah, that's the question. What else would you now that you've re-entered the college environment as an auditor? Do you see other areas that you would that you could benefit from? I mean, well, right language. now I'm pretty much sticking with the Latin as mm -hmm. long as they'll have me. They may get sick of me someday and throw me out, but mm -hmm. I have Bard too and Hunter. I did take a course at Hunter. Uh, I probably, you know, I had very little history. I would probably go into some more history. Mm -hmm. There is a course, a part of me that thinks learning Italian would now be rather easy between the French and the yeah. Latin. When I was in Italy at the end of the book. Um, I couldn't hear Italian, but I could almost read the newspaper. Interesting. Okay, I, and I'd, I'd wondered. You mentioned teaching uh, Hispanic kids and oh, how yeah. having yeah. having Spanish as their primary language, mm -hmm. you know, gives mm -hmm. them a little more facility mm -hmm. with a uh, with, with Latin. So, yeah, I'm interested in seeing if 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 Italian turns into something that's that's doable. Being able to compare, though. Um, studying French when you were younger and your brain is more pliable, frankly, uh, versus doing Latin in your 60s, was it, was the memorization more difficult or the conceptual? No, actually, you know? I think the conceptual part was in some ways easier for me mm -hmm. because I'm that much more sophisticated verbally and I have paid that much more attention to the structure of syntax in my life. This is why I wonder why we don't have spelling bees for adults. Yeah. Because I sort of think we would be better than kids, at least those well, of us who are in, in the word world. I like spelling but. leaves something to be desired. 
Um, I didn't correct anything in your email, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the memorization, mm -hmm. really hard. Is it because my brain is that much more fried? Probably. But also, I haven't memorized anything in a really long time. Mm -hmm. And it's an underused, I, as I said, I think I, it's right here above the ear. It's an underused faculty for many adults. And I now repeat to myself Catullus 101 every single day. I can recite it without notes. Mm -hmm. Would you like to? I would love to. Go ahead. I'm just going to put it here just in just case. In case. Multas per gentes e multas per aquara vectus has miseras frater ad inferias ut te post remo donere munere mortis e nequam e e mutam ne quiquam aloquere kineram quando quida fortuna mihi te tabstuli ipsum. Ho miser frate indigne ademte mihi, nuc interi yike prisco que mores parentes traditi sunt, munerad inferias acipe fraterno multam manantia fleto ad quin perpetuum frater alatque vale. Very nice. Can you translate? I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> having conveyed, been conveyed through many people and through many waters, I come to this sad place, brother, to the place of the dead, uh, to at last give you the rights of the dead, and in vain to speak with your uh, silent ashes. Since Fortuna has taken you away from me, oh, wretched brother, Un, un, uh, indignantly should not have been taken from me. Now, however, with this, as the old ones, uh, as the old uh, traditions of our parents have been handed down to us, uh, what is owed to the for the rights of the dead. Take this, take this, brother with many flowing tears and forever brother hail and farewell there is a little part of me and i probably can never do it because i would start crying that feels like i could change frater to mater mm -hmm. and do what my book did because at some level i think that's what happened and i didn't expect it to yeah. and patty thank you so much for coming on the thank virtual you. memory show Thank you. Ago multas gratias tibi ad hibenti transmissioni brevier tuum. Which is? I thank you very much for inviting me on your podcast. You're welcome. Which I'll say in Latin. Libenter. Libenter. And that was Anne Patty. Visit her website, annepatty.com, so you can learn more about her new book, Living with a Dead Language, My Romance with Latin. And Anne Patty is A-N-N-P-A-T-T-Y. And if you're listening to this the first day or so that it's been posted, and you're in the New York City area, uh, then you can go see Anne on Wednesday, June 29th, 2016, at the Barnes & Noble on Broadway between 82nd and 83rd at 7 p.m. If you're a procrastinator... I don't know what to tell you. You really should get on the ball. Anyway, Living with a Dead Language, My Romance with Latin, is published by Viking. It's available in good bookstores everywhere, and I enjoyed the living heck out of it. Now, after the main conversation, I asked Anne, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear her answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories show so you can get access to our monthly podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, patron-only blog, which includes the list of all the books that Ann and I talked about in this show, uh, 
series of ebooks that I'm hoping to launch and more. So go to patreon.com slash VMS pod and support the art of fine conversation. And if you don't like Patreon, just go to paypal.me slash VMS pod and make a donation that way. And if you do, you'll get access to the same material through our side site, fearofasquareplanet.com. A special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, and Kyle Peterson for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. This episode was recorded at Anne's home in Rhinebeck. Um, there were a bunch of tolls on that drive, but no parking pr uh, cost, no no coffee expenditure even. So, you know, I made off pretty easy, maybe about 15 bucks or so, and most of my Saturday. If you want to help defray some of my costs, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at Facebook dot com slash david and david music and that's it for this week's virtual memory show thanks so much for listening i'll be back next week um but i haven't decided which episode to go with frankly um i might go with the artist paul mavridis and um that would only be because he's of greek descent and that would keep the greco-roman theme going for another week it's kind of a stretch because he's not a classicist but whatever maybe it'll be him maybe it'll be mk brown maybe it'll be malcolm margolin you'll have to tune in and find out and until next time you can subscribe to the show and download past episodes at the itunes store you can find all our episodes and get in our email list at either of our websites too vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm and you can follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter at VMS Pod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, and at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. And that'll help us build a bigger audience. And until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Mm -hmm.